This course will help you master LangChain, a revolutionary AI-first framework. LangChain enables developers to build context-aware reasoning applications by linking large language models with external data sources for advanced natural language processing applications. Starting with the basics of text processing and vectorization, and advancing to the nuanced aspects of LangChain's expression language and retrieval techniques, you'll gain hands-on experience in building real-world AI applications. Tom Champ developed this course. He is an experienced developer and course creator at Scrimba. Hey there, free code campers, and welcome to this interactive course where you're going to learn how to use LangChain.js to build a context-aware chatbot that can answer questions on a specific document we provided. We're starting with the basics, so you don't need any prior experience with LangChain.js or even with AI. The only prerequisites for this course are a knowledge of working with APIs and vanilla JavaScript. Now, Langchain has a reputation for a steep learning curve, but using its new expression language, we make the journey much easier. This is a project-based course with challenges, and that means you're going to get your hands on the keyboard writing code throughout. And if you're wondering how you can access the project code, don't worry, we've got you covered. From the interactive version of this course on scrimba.com, you can pause the video, edit the code, and run the projects right there in your browser. Or you can download the code from the scrims and run them locally if you prefer. The link is in the description. And one final thing, if you enjoyed this course, do hit the thumbs up right here on YouTube. And if you'd like to get in touch, reach out to me. I'm on Twitter or X at TPChant. Okay, let's dive in. Langchain to build AI-powered applications. I am super excited to bring you this course on using one of the most mind-blowing technologies in the emerging AI universe. We are going to study embeddings. We'll be working with vector stores. We'll be building templates and creating prompts from those templates. Next, we'll look at setting up chains, and we'll do that using Langchain's expression language, which is a more expressive and accessible way to write Langchain. We'll be looking at the pipe method to join elements of a chain together. We'll be retrieving data from a vector store, and then we'll use the runnable sequence class, which is a really cool way to create complex chains in Langchain. And there's loads more plus challenges. This is our project. We are building a bot which is knowledgeable on information we give it. So this bot is going to know all about our platform, scrimba.com, and we're going to feed it 3,000 words of information, and then we'll be able to interrogate it on this information. This is one of the most powerful uses of AI, and it's a process that Langchain makes easy. Now, in this course, we're going to focus on the Langchain syntax. The project is built in vanilla JavaScript, and you're welcome to refactor it into any framework or library you wish. I'm assuming you have a solid knowledge of vanilla JavaScript, but you don't need to be an expert. If you've worked with APIs and asynchronous JavaScript a little bit before, you're going to be absolutely fine. My name is Tom Chant, and I will be your tutor for this course. You can find me on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. I am at TPChant, and you can click this link and visit me there. It's always good to hear how you got on and any feedback you might have. Now, before you begin, why not head over to our Discord server and meet the community and let everybody know that you're starting this course in the Today I Will channel. And again, this slide is a link to that page on our Discord server. Before we dive into the concepts and code, let's get an intro to Langchain from the founding software engineer of Langchain, Jacob Lee. Yes, Langchain is a framework that helps developers build context-aware reasoning applications. Langchain was born out of the realization that the process of developing sophisticated AI-powered apps could be significantly streamlined by factoring out some common abstractions. While much of current AI app development takes place in the realm of Python, there is a clear need for better tooling for the more web dev focused JavaScript community too. Hence, Langchain comes in two flavors, and one of the aims of Langchain.js is to make large language models and techniques around working with them more accessible to this broader audience. In this course, you'll be learning how to use Langchain.js to build your own apps. It focuses in on conversational retrieval over a document, giving an LLM access to the specific information in that document so it can answer questions and continue a logical, contextualized conversation 
on topics beyond its original training data. Along the way, you will use models, prompts, and output parsers, some of the basic building blocks of LangChain. We'll create chains of calls that enable us to connect up the various stages in the process needed to get the desired output. We'll be using LangChain with Superbase and the OpenAI API, but one of the beauties of this framework is that components are easily swappable. So you can work with a myriad of databases, vector stores, and LLMs, switch between them, and find the one which works for you best. Good luck, and I really hope you enjoy this course and enjoy using LangChain to spin up really powerful AI web apps. of how this app is going to work. In this first section, we need to work with our data. So this chatbot is going to be knowledgeable about a specific topic, in this case, the Scrimba platform. So we're going to start off with an information source, which holds the knowledge we want the chatbot to have. And we're going to pass this document to a splitter. And the splitter is a Langchain tool which will split the document into chunks. And then we're going to use an embeddings model from OpenAI to create vectors from each chunk. And we're going to save those chunks to our vector store, which in this case is going to be a Superbase vector store. When we get to this point, the vector store is established. It's got all of the knowledge we want it to have, and we won't need to repeat this process unless we want to give it more knowledge by adding some new data. Now, if you don't understand the justification for each step, or you're not really clear on vectors and embeddings yet, don't worry, we're going to go into a lot more detail when we actually write the code. This is just an overview. Now, once we've got the vector store set up, we need to create the app to use it. And the flow of that app is going to look like this. We start off with a user, which we've got represented right here. And that user will input something, probably a question they have about Scrimba. And we're going to do two things with that question. We're going to save it to a conversation memory store, which will hold the entire conversation. And we'll use an open AI model to convert it to a standalone question. And that just means we're going to reduce it to a very concise question with no unnecessary words. We'll then take that standalone question and we'll use an OpenAI embeddings model to create vectors from it. We'll send those vectors to our Superbase vector store and we'll get back the chunk or chunks with the nearest match. Therefore, the chunks that are most likely to contain the answer to our question. The last stage is to use an OpenAI model to get the final answer. And to give it the best chance of getting a good answer, we're going to give it three pieces of information. We're going to bring down the nearest matches from the vector store. We'll give it the original user input. And we'll also give it the conversation memory, which will be the entire conversation that has taken place so far. So that might be a very, very long conversation, or this might be the first question in the conversation. Now we're going to take the response that we get and we'll store it in the conversation memory, ready to continue the conversation. And also we'll give it back to the user by rendering it to the DOM. Now, again, this is a very high level overview and it might well cause some confusion. For example, what actually is a standalone question and why are we using it right here? But then down here, we're using the original user input and not the standalone question. But rather than get caught up in that right now and give very theoretical answers, what I want to do is keep referring to this diagram as we write the code, and we're going to tackle those questions as they come up one by one. So if this diagram looks horribly confusing right now, don't worry at all, we are going to take it step by step. Okay, in the next scrim, let's go right back to the beginning and think about getting some data into our vector store. But before we do that, I'm going to bring in a scrim from my colleague Gil, who's going to give you a detailed overview of embeddings. So sit back and take a few minutes to watch that next. Powered search shapes many parts of your daily lives. Every day you interact with platforms sifting through massive amounts of data from text and images to audio and video. Think about Amazon recommending products or search engines refining your queries. Social media platforms curate tailored content, while services like YouTube, Netflix, and Spotify offer suggestions based on your preferences. Now, advanced AIs, despite their capabilities, don't truly understand the real world as we do. They can't grasp the actual meaning or nuance of a video title, song, or news article. So how exactly do AIs and platforms like Spotify, Netflix, and YouTube truly get us? How is it that they appear to understand, predict, and respond to us as effectively as, if not better, than people? 
Well, the magic behind this capability involves a blend of algorithms, AI models, and huge amounts of data. But a larger part of the answer involves embeddings. You see, when you present a question to an AI, it first needs to translate it into a format it can understand. So you can think of embeddings as the language that AI understands. The term embedding is a mathematical concept that refers to placing one object into a different space. Think of it like taking a word or sentence, which is in a content space, and transforming it into a different representation, like a set of numbers in a vector space, all while preserving its original meaning and the relationships between other words and phrases. AI systems process lots of data, from user inputs to information in databases. At the heart of this processing are embeddings, which are vectors representing that data. Transforming content like search queries, photos, songs, or videos into vectors gives machines the power to effectively compare, categorize, and understand the content in a way that's almost human. So how is all of this possible? Well, it isn't exactly as easy as just turning data into vectors. So before we go any deeper, let's take a closer look at what vectors are. Think of a vector as a coordinate or point in space. And to keep things simple, we'll have a look at this 2D graph with an X and Y axis. Let's say that a word like cat is translated into a vector like 4.5, 12.2, which is this point. This vector encapsulates the meaning and nuances of the word cat in a way an AI model can understand. And then we have the word feline represented by a nearby vector of 4.7, 12.6. So we'll place that point on the graph. Now, words that have similar meanings are numerically similar and tend to be closely positioned in the vector space. So this closeness implies that cat and feline have similar meanings. Now let's say we have the word or vectors for kitten, which might also be close to cat and feline, but maybe slightly further apart due to its age-related nuance. Now a dog is different, but still in the same general domain of domesticated animals. So the word dog might be represented by a vector that's not too distant, but clearly in a different region. Let's say 7.5, 10.5. And even a phrase like man's best friend, which is a colloquial term for a dog, could be represented by a vector that's close to the vector for dog. On the other hand, a word like building is not related in meaning to any of these, so its vector would be much further apart. Let's say 15.3, 3.9. Here's another example that demonstrates how embeddings might capture semantic meaning and relationships between words. Let's say we have the word king represented by the vector two, five. Then man is the vector one, three, and woman is represented by the vector one, four. Now let's do some quick vector arithmetic. We'll start with the vector for king, then subtract the vector for man to remove the male context, and add the vector for woman to introduce new context. After performing this vector math, our resulting vector is 2, 6. So we'll plot that point on the graph. And let's say there's another word in our space, queen, represented by the vector 2, 6.2, right here. Well, this vector is extremely close to the resulting vector, so we might identify queen as the most similar word based on that vector, just as a trained AI model would. Now, a two-dimensional graph is a massive simplification, as real-world embeddings often exist in much higher dimensional spaces, sometimes spanning hundreds or even thousands of dimensions. For example, the actual vector embedding for the word queen might have values across multiple dimensions. Each dimension or number in this vector might capture a different semantic or contextual aspect of the word queen. For instance, royalty, Cleopatra, or even chess. This is what allows the AIs to recognize and differentiate between these contexts when the word is used in different scenarios. Now imagine embedding hundreds of thousands of words and phrases into this high dimensional space. Some words will naturally gravitate closer to one another due to their similarities, forming clusters, while others are further apart or sparsely distributed in the space. These relationships between vectors are extremely useful. Think back to Spotify's method of embedding tracks in a vector space. Tracks that are positioned closely together are likely to be played one after the other. All right, so what else can we do with embeddings and how are they used in the real world? Well, you can imagine how embeddings have revolutionized our daily experiences. For example, search engines have evolved to understand the essence of your queries and content, moving beyond mere keyword matching. And recommendation systems with the aid of embeddings suggest products, movies, or songs that truly resonate with our preferences and purchase history. For example, Netflix uses them to create a tailored and personalized platform to maximize engagement and retention. 
Also, in the healthcare industry, embeddings are used to analyze medical images and extract information doctors can use to diagnose diseases. And in the finance world, embeddings help with analyzing financial data and making predictions about stock prices or currency exchange rates. So every time you interact with an AI chatbot, every time an app recommends something, behind the scenes, embeddings are at work translating data into meaning. All right, so how are these embeddings actually created? Well, let's dive into that next. that Langchain integrates with. And if you go to the Langchain docs and check out modules, retrieval, vector stores and integrations, you will see a whole long list of them. And by the way, this slide is a link through to that page in the docs. Now for this project, we're going to use Superbase. And Superbase is a really popular and very user-friendly vector store. But one of the beauties of Langchain is that it's actually really easy to swap out your vector store. So if you want to experiment with various possible integrations, that won't be too much trouble at all. Now, our first task is to set up a Superbase account. So, so head over to superbase.com. And again, this slide is a link to superbase.com. And let's select start your project. And there you can sign up with your email or GitHub. And once you've completed the sign up, you'll end up at the dashboard. So let's go to new project and we need to give the project a name. I'm going to call this one Scrimberbot and we'll also need a database password. And I'm just going to allow it to generate a random password for me. And lastly, I just need to select my location. I'm here in Western Europe, not that far from London. So that will do just fine. Then we can scroll down to the bottom and just click create new project. Now you'll wait a while while it initializes a couple of minutes at the most and eventually you're going to end up here. And that shows us that we've got one database successfully set up. Now if you click on this tables icon on the left hand side, here in the table editor tab is where you could manually set up a table, but we don't need to do any of that because Langchain is going to do it all for us. If we go back to the Langchain docs to the Superbase integrations page and we just scroll down, we get this chunk of code and we're going to run this in our Superbase database and it's going to do everything that we need. Now, I've just pasted this code into Scrimba just so it's easier to look at. And just to be clear, we're not running SQL or SQL right here in Scrimba. We'll be running it in Superbase and I'll show you how in just a moment. But I just wanted to put it right here so we can have a look at it in a bit more detail. So what this code does is it enables a PG vector extension in Superbase. It then creates our table with everything that we need in that table and it sets the embeddings to 1536. And that's an important number because the OpenAI embeddings model use 1536 dimensions. It also gives us this match documents function and it's this function which actually does the job of finding the nearest match. So later we'll be using this function to take the vectors from a question and find the nearest vectors from the text chunks because that will identify identify the text chunks which are most likely to contain the correct answer. So all we need to do with this code is copy it, go back to Superbase and come into the SQL editor tab, which is this second one down and paste it right in there. Now at the moment it's just called untitled query, which is not a great name. So I'm just going to change mine to match documents because that's what this main function in it is called. Now it tells us click run to execute your query. So we can do that right here. And there we are, it says success. And if we go to the table editor and we click on documents, we can see that we've got our empty table. We've got the ID, the content, the metadata and the embedding, i.e. the vector. And that is what we asked for right here where we said create table documents. So that has worked just fine. We've got this warning about allowing anonymous access, but don't worry about that right now. This is going to be absolutely fine for prototyping. Now, if you'd like to take a deeper dive into vectors and embeddings and exactly what Superbase is doing here, do check out this blog post that I've linked to right here. It's got quite a lot of information. Okay, so now our database is ready to go. So in the next scrim, let's start getting some vectors into the vector store. which is going to be the knowledge for our chatbot and split it into chunks. And the idea is that each chunk will be big enough to hold a piece of information. So what you want to avoid is having something like this. One chunk where we say we update our courses 
and a second chunk saying on a regular basis. That piece of information needs to be in one chunk, else it's pretty much useless. Now, a chunk will often not be that small. In fact, lots of our chunks are going to hold whole paragraphs, so there'll be something much more like that. And it doesn't matter at all if there's more than one piece of information in a chunk. And in fact, that's very likely going to happen. All we're trying to achieve here is being able to give an AI model a smallish chunk of text from which it can find the answer to a question. What we could do is just upload a massive document with every request to, say, the OpenAI API, but that would be very, very expensive with tokens. So what we're doing here is much more economical, much more performance, and much more scalable. Okay, that's the theory, and this is the actual text that we're going to be using for our chatbot. It's about 3,000 words long, and I've checked and vetted all of the information myself. That's really important. If the information in the document at the start is faulty, you're never going to make a good chatbot. Now, I'm using a text file here for simplicity, but Langchain has actually got several tools for working with different formats. So you can click through to this section in the docs and it will show you options like parsing PDF or extracting just the text from HTML to give you just two examples. But here, we're going to keep it simple and just use a text file. So in index.js then, I've got this try catch we're fetching in scrimber-info.text and I've just got it saved in this const text. And in the next scrim, let's bring in the text splitter tool from Langchain and get to work. Knowledge source for our chatbot and now we need to split it. And we're going to do that using a tool from Langchain which will do most of the work for us. So I've got the Langchain dependency already installed. And in Scrimber, we do that using a three dot menu that appears when you hover over dependencies. You can't see it in the recording, but when you click on that three dot menu and select add dependency, a dialog box appears and I can type in Langchain and it does the rest for me. Outside of Scrimber, of course, you can use npm install Langchain. Okay, now Langchain offers us a couple of tools to split text. There is the character text splitter and the recursive character text splitter. I'm going to use the latter, which is just a little bit more sophisticated. But to be honest, you can use either, and I didn't see a big difference in performance between them in this app. So let's import the tool from Langchain. And if you want the more basic character text splitter, it's just going to look like that. Okay, let's save a new instance of this recursive character text splitter to a const splitter. And then we'll save our output. We'll call splitter and use the create documents method. Now we need to pass create documents an array, and inside the array we can list out what we want to be split. We've only got one file, text, but if we wanted to upload to a vector store from multiple files, we could list them out in here. Okay, let's just log out the output and see what we get. And I'll hit save, and then in the console we can just see a promise, and that's because this is an async process, so we need to await it. And there we are, as soon as we do that, we see our chunks of text. And I'm just going to copy one of those chunks and bring it over to output MD so we can have a look at it. So it looks like this, we've got page content and that has got the actual chunk of data. Now it's actually much, much longer than that. The Scrimba console truncates it heavily. And then we've also got the metadata. The metadata is quite interesting. It gives us the location of that text chunk, lines one to 14. So what we're actually looking at, if we go back to scrimberinfo.txt, is right from the beginning, from 1 down to 14. So that is our text chunk. Now, we won't be using this location data in our app, but it is good to know for future reference that if you need to refer to where some information came from, you have got that information right there provided to you by this text splitting tool. Now, this text splitter that we've used, the recursive character text splitter, has made some assumptions about chunk size. It actually defaults to a thousand characters. Does chunk size matter? Well, yeah, you bet it does. Larger chunks get more context. Smaller chunks get more granular semantic info. If you go to either extreme, performance could suffer. And if chunks are really big, sending that off to the AI models will get expensive. Now, of course, there's no best way of splitting, and you do have to consider the text you're working with. I've experimented a bit, and I want to go for a chunk size of 500, not 1000. So I'm going to come in here with an object, 
and override the default settings. So I'll set my chunk size to 500. Again, we'll hit save. And what you can see is where before the first chunk went from lines 1 to 14, now we're going from lines 1 to 8. So the chunk is a little bit smaller. And I'm just going to use Chrome DevTools, not Scrimba's console, to get the text from the first two chunks. Okay, so there we are. We've got the first text chunk and the second text chunk right here. And what you'll notice is that these text chunks are actually split quite nicely into paragraphs. This first one ends at a very natural point, and this second one does as well. And that is not an accident. And you'll also notice we've got some overlap here. This is a repetition of what we've got right here. And again, that is not accidental. So if we just go back to this object, and I can come in here and show you a couple more defaults. Firstly, we have these separators and the separators are an array and they go in order. So we've got the double new line to break a paragraph, the single new line, the space, and then no space. So what this recursive character text splitter does is actually quite complex. It uses those separators to split text into chunks based on the size, but prioritizing keeping paragraphs, then sentences, then words together intact. So that's why in these text chunks we've got right here, we've got more than one piece of information, but that's absolutely fine because they're both contained inside a chunk and they both finish on a natural break and we've got some overlap. Now we can also override the overlap and it actually defaults to 200, which is quite a lot. So I'm going to come in here and this is called chunk overlap and I'm going to set it to 50, so 10% of our chunk size, which is a good rule of thumb to start with, and you can always experiment. Now, you won't always see overlap, and that's because when the paragraphs fit neatly into the chunks and the overlap size is not big enough to include a whole sentence, then the overlap won't be applied. It will actually only be applied if the chunk size does not end with one of the first two separators, so the double new line or the single new line. So that is all a little bit confusing. And I wouldn't recommend that you worry about it too much. Do play around with it. Try different strategies. Also try the more basic character text splitter and just see which one gets you the best performance with your chatbot. And remember, you can always come back and adjust it later if necessary. Now, I should just add that if you've got some other separators in your document, it's quite popular to use, say, the double hashtag. You can also just add them to this array. It does accept custom separators. Okay, I haven't got any of them in our document, so I'm going to delete that. And the next thing to do then is to take these chunks of text and get them uploaded to the vector store. So let's look at that in the next scrim. To store. And the first thing that I'm going to do is come in here and save our Superbase URL and API key to consts. And we can get all of the information that we need from the dashboard. If you come down here to settings and select API, here we have got the project URL and the API key. And I've saved mine in my environment variables. So I'm just going to come in here and set up the consts. And of course, you'll need to use whatever you called your URL and API key when you set up your M variable. Now, I'm also going to bring in the OpenAI API key as we're going to need that in just a moment. Next, I need to set up a Superbase client and we do that using the create client method, which we get from Superbase. So before we can use that, I need to add the Superbase dependency. And there we are, the Superbase dependency has appeared. And I'm just going to put the name of the dependency in a comment, just so you can see it a little bit more clearly. Okay, now we've got that Superbase dependency, we need to import the create client method from it. And now we can use create client to set up a client. Now let's use create client with our URL and API key to set up a Superbase client. In the final stage of this, we do two things at once. We're going to create our embeddings and we're going to upload them to the vector store. To do that, we need two tools from Nangchain, the Superbase Vector Store and the OpenAI Embeddings class. So let me just import them quickly.
Okay, first we're going to use the SuperBase Vector Store class. So down here, I will say await because it does work asynchronously. SuperBase Vector Store, and we're going to use its from documents method. And we need to give this method three pieces of information. The first one is the output that we've got right here. So remember, the output is the chunks of text that we've split. Next, we need to tell it how to create our embeddings, and we're going to do that with the OpenAI embeddings that we've just imported. So we'll set up a new instance of that class, and we just need to pass it our OpenAI API key, which we've got right here. Now, we could pass that as a key value pair like this, but as the key and the value are actually the same, we don't need to do that. We can use the shorthand version. Okay, the third piece of information is an object holding our SuperBase details. So it needs our client. And again, we don't need to write out the key value pair. We can just use the shorthand version. It also needs a table name. And if we go back to SuperBase, we can just see that when we go to the tables tab, our table name is just documents. And just before we run into an error, let's remember that this needs to be a string. Okay, let's hit save and see if it works. And actually, we should have logged something out there with a success message, but I totally forgot. But now we can go back to our SuperBase dashboard, and I'm just going to come up here to the Tables tab, and let's go to Documents, and we can see it's worked. We have got our data. We've got the ID, the content, which is the text for each chunk, the metadata, and the actual embedding. Here are our vectors. And remember, this field is huge. We have got 1536 dimensions here. Okay, now we've got our vectors in our vector store, we can start work on the app that's going to allow us to query this vector store. So when you're ready for that, let's go. We already have. Over on the right hand side, you can see that we've still got our dependencies from Langchain and Superbase. Now, this event listener at the top is listening out for user input. So it's basically picking up clicks on this button when a user submits a question. We've also still got our API key here that we're bringing in from our environment variable. And that just leaves this function, progress conversation, so called because it progresses the conversation onwards and also does the heavy lifting of updating the DOM so the user can actually see what response they've got back from the AI. Now, it's all fairly straightforward JavaScript, but do feel free to pause and take a look through. And also do check out the HTML and CSS if you want to. Again, it's fairly standard stuff. OK, so that's the code we're starting with. So where do we go next with this project? Well, let's head back to the diagram and see where we go first. So we take the user's input. We've got the event listener listening out for that. And then we do two things. We've got the conversation memory right here and the standalone question right here. I want to focus in on the standalone question first. So let's start by unraveling its mysteries and see what it actually is and why we want it. So we'll come on to that in the next scrim. question. And just to be clear, there are two things we need to do with the user's input. They're creating the standalone question and adding the user's input to the conversation memory. Now, we're actually going to deal with memory at the very end. So let's just ignore that for the time being and concentrate in on the standalone question. So what actually is a standalone question? Well, a standalone question is just a question reduced to the minimum number of words needed to express the request for information. OK, but why do we want one? Well, we can't control what a user asks our chatbot. And actually, a user could easily ask a question in a way that's likely to get a vague or even an inaccurate response. And we really want to avoid that. So imagine you have an online clothes shop and a user asks something like this. I'm thinking of buying one of your t-shirts, but I need to know what your returns policy is as some t-shirts just don't fit me and I don't want to waste money. It's a perfectly reasonable question, but let's remember how chatbots work. We're trying to find the nearest matching vectors and therefore the chunk of text that will likely hold the answer to our question. We want to create an embedding from this question and find the nearest matching vector and therefore the chunk of text that will likely hold the answer to the question 
in our vector database. But there's so much going on with this question that the vector for it will be polluted. Remember, a vector represents the semantic meaning, not the precise words. So what we want to do to maximize the accuracy of our chatbot is just extract the intended semantic meaning from this question. What we want to focus in on is, I need to know what your returns policy is. And we can reduce that to a standalone question that will simply be this. What is your returns policy? That is what the user wants to know. And so that is what we need to search for in our knowledge document. So that will be our first task. And to do that, we need to take a look at how prompts work in Langchain and also how we send them off to the LLM, the large language model. So let's do that in the next scrim. chain to set up a simple prompt. And just for demonstration purposes, we're going to move away from our main project and imagine we're building an app which generates a promotional tweet for a given product. We've got the Langchain dependency already installed right here. And of course, we're bringing in the OpenAI API key. Next, we need to import two things from Langchain. First, the chat OpenAI class, and we also need the prompt template class. So let's set up our LLM and save it to a const. So we'll take the chat OpenAI class and pass in our API key. Now we could instead pass in nothing. And if we do that, Langchain will check process.env.openai API key and use it if it's available. So we could actually delete this line of code as well. But to be honest, I think it's clearer if we just add it manually. So I'm going to do it that way. And also, if we wanted to override any OpenAI defaults, we could do that right here in this object. For example, we could change the temperature setting. So now this LLM will use a temperature of 0 0.5. But to be honest, I don't want that. I'm just going to leave everything at default for now. OK, now let's create a template for our tweet. And I'm going to save it in a const tweet template. And I'm just going to say, generate a promotional tweet for a product from this product description. And we need to give it a product description. So I'm just going to put the product description variable inside curly braces. Now, as soon as you see the curly braces, you might think that this is a standard JavaScript template literal. It's actually not. There's no dollar sign needed here. This input variable will be picked up by Langchain. And of course, we could have several input variables here if we wanted to. If this prompt was going to be a little bit more complex, we could also have, for example, price and anything else we needed. But let's just keep this really simple. OK, now we need to turn this template into a prompt. So I'm going to set up a const for the prompt. And now we can use the prompt template class and that comes with the from template method. And then we just need to pass in our template. And before we go any further, why don't we just log out the tweet prompt and see what we've got. I'll hit save and we're getting an error. Let's just check the console and it says chat open AI cannot be invoked without new. OK, that's a pretty clear error. We needed the new keyword right here. Let's try that one more time. And there we are, we've got our prompt. And just so we can look at it a little bit more easily, I'm just going to bring it into a markdown file and format it. OK, so we can see that we've got our prompt right here, just as we wrote it. And the interesting thing is that we've got this input variables property, and that is holding product desk. So that's telling the prompt which inputs to expect. And this is an array, so if we had lots of input variables, they would just be listed out in this array. And now that the prompt is expecting them, it's going to throw an error if it doesn't get them. Another interesting thing to notice here that the template format is an F string. And an F string is something which comes from Python, and it is the kind of Python equivalent to a template literal. OK, so that is our prompt ready to go. So in the next scrim, let's take a look at how we can use it to generate some content. template, it's time to set up our first chain in Langchain. I'll set up a const tweet chain to hold it. And what this chain will consist of is our prompt chained to our LLM. And to join the two parts of the chain together, we use the pipe method. And I'm going to pass in the LLM. So the pipe method is joining the two aspects of the chain. It takes the output from the first, which will be the prompt, and it passes it to the LLM. It's a really simple chain with just one connection. Again, let's just log that out and see what we get. 
And again, I'm just going to paste that into our markdown file. Okay, we've got quite a lot going on here, but I want to draw your attention particularly to runnable sequence, because that is a theme that we're going to be coming back to quite a bit in this course. But just by way of an intro, what we've got here is a runnable sequence, and we can see that this object right here is called first, and that is the first element in our chain. We've got our prompt right here with our input variables, and then we've also got last, which is the last section of the chain. And here you can see that we have got our OpenAI LLM or large language model. Now, if this were a more complex chain, here in the middle we would see some more steps. But for now, it's just enough to know that this runnable sequence exists. Okay, so if we go back to index.js, what we need to do next then is invoke this chain to start the sequence in motion. And we're going to do that with a method called invoke. So let's set up a response. And we need to await our tweet chain because this is an asynchronous process. Now let's call the invoke method on the chain. And we'll just log out the response. Now, if we hit save right now, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we're getting an error. Down in the console, it says missing value for input product desk. Well, that figures because look, we're expecting an input variable right here, product desk, and we're not actually introducing a product description to the chain. So what we need to do then is pass in an object right where we invoke the chain. So you can think of this as passing something in right to the beginning of the chain. And what we need to pass in is a product description. So product desk will be our key. And then the value will be whichever product we want a tweet for. OK, let's save that again. And down in the console, we have got our tweet. And in fact, we can zone in specifically on the tweet by saying response.content. And there we are, we've got our tweet, it's even got some emoji and some hashtags, so this is working. Okay, this would be a great time just to pause, make sure you understand this code, maybe generate a couple of tweets, perhaps make this tweet template a little bit more complex with multiple input variables. And then when you're ready, we'll go back to our main project where we need a prompt and a model, and that will give us a great opportunity to have our first challenge. So when you're ready for that, just move on. prompt template and chat OpenAI already imported. We've also got our OpenAI API key and the LLM already set up. So here is your challenge. I want you to create a prompt to turn a user's question into a standalone question. And I've just put a hint here. The AI understands the concept of a standalone question. You don't need to explain it. Just ask for it. Then create a chain with the prompt and the model. And lastly, invoke the chain, remembering to pass in a question. And for now, we'll just log out the response to check it's working. Now, just to be clear, in this challenge, we are not going to be wiring this up to the chat interface yet. If we were going to do that, we would have to actually come down here into this progress conversation function and update some of the logic in here. It's a little bit of unnecessary complication at this point. We will be coming on to that later. Also, I've given you the four consts that you're actually going to need to complete this challenge, and we're just logging out the response right here. I've also given you some hints above each const, and I've done that because there is quite a lot of new syntax here. And of course, you are welcome to go back to that scrim to check the syntax if you need to, but hopefully with these hints, that might not be necessary. Now, when you do this, just remember that the question you pass in should be quite a long-winded question because the idea is to reduce that question down to just the bare minimum. So you want to make that a long question with some unnecessary words. It's only then that we'll be able to see that it works. OK, pause now, take all the time you need, and I'll see you back here in just a moment. OK, so hopefully that went just fine. So we'll start off with the standalone question template. This is going to be a string and we're just going to ask for what we want. So I'm going to say, given a question, convert it to a standalone question. And then I'm going to say question colon. And here I'll use the curly braces and we'll introduce the input variable, which is question. Now I'll invite the model to provide us with the standalone question by saying standalone question and just finishing on a colon. So that's like an invitation to complete. Right, now we need the prompt. So let's set standalone question prompt equals to prompt template. 
and we'll use the from template method and pass in standalone question template. Then we'll set up the chain. So we'll take the prompt that we've just created and we're going to link up the chain with the pipe method. And we're piping the LLM. And remember, we've got the LLM already set up right here. Okay, to check it's working, we need to invoke it and pass in a question. So we'll take that chain, and this is an async process, so we'll await the standalone question chain, call the invoke method, and we'll pass in an object. We've got the input variable that the prompt is expecting right here, it's question. And for our question, I'm going to go for something quite long-winded. I've asked, what are the technical requirements for running Scrimba? I only have a very old laptop, which is not that powerful. Okay, we're logging out the response. So let's hit save and see what we get down in the console. And there we are. Can a very old laptop meet the technical requirements for running Scrimba? It's reduced that question down to a standalone question. It's just asking for the precise information and it's removed unnecessary words. Okay, that is the first part done. So now is a really good time to take a break and relax, especially if you've been working at this for a while. And when you're ready to go on, we're going to look at how we can take our standalone question to get chunks of matching text from the vector store. But there is quite a lot to do that. There are several steps in that process and some preparation. So for now, take a moment to chill and come back when you're ready. and see where we are. And we are right here. So we've taken the user's input and we've created this standalone question from it. And the next step will be to create embeddings from that standalone question and then take that to the vector store to find the closest match. So if we have a standalone question like what is a scrim, we'll use the embeddings model to create our vector. And then in the vector store, we will search through all of the vectors, we'll find the closest match, and we'll take that chunk of text. Now, this diagram is a little bit of a simplification. We might not just take one chunk of text, we might take two, three, even ten chunks of text. And a bit later on, we'll look at how we can exert control over how many chunks we retrieve from the vector store. Okay, before we can do any of that, we need some basic setup. So I've brought in a few imports here, which we've seen before. We've got the Superbase Vector Store class. I've also brought in the OpenAI embeddings from Langchain and Create Client, both of which we used before when uploading to the Vector Store. So those are all of the imports we need for now. And then down here, I've set up a new instance of embeddings. I've passed in the OpenAI API key. Do remember that if you don't pass anything in, Langchain by default will look for API key in this format and do it for you. I'm going to pass it in here manually just for clarity. Okay, we've also got our Superbase API key and the Superbase URL, and we've used that to set up the client. And again, that is identical code to when we were uploading to the data store. Okay, now things get a bit different to what we did before. Let's store a new instance of the Superbase vector store in a const, and we're going to pass it our embeddings model. And we'll also pass it a configuration object. In this configuration object, we only really need to pass it the client. But again, just for clarity, I'm also going to pass it the table name. And our table name in Superbase was documents. We can see that one right here in the Superbase dashboard. And I'm also going to give it the query name. And again, if we look at the Superbase dashboard, we've got this query match documents, which we named after this function match documents. So let's pass that in right here. So these two are both defaults, but I think it's a good idea to put them in here right now because if in the future you're working with a more advanced use case, perhaps you've got more than one table or more than one query name, it's important that you know that this is where you can configure your vector store. Okay, now this is quite different to what we were doing when we were uploading to the vector store. We actually want to retrieve something. And without Langchain, we would have to actually write a ton of code to do that. But now all we're going to do is create a new const and I'm going to call it retriever and I'm going to set it equals to our vector store. And I'm going to call the as retriever method on it. And that is all we need to do. This as retriever method knows to go to the vector store and instead of inserting more data to use the matching documents function that we added here to find the nearest matches. So that makes it nice and easy. And if you'll remember, this match documents query came straight from the Langchain docs. So all of that provided by Langchain just makes life really easy.
Okay, this retriever is now finished, and that means it can now be added as an element in a Langchain chain. So let's do that next. We're just going to come in here down to our chain, which we've got right here, and we're just going to pipe the retriever on the end. So what should now happen is that we invoke the chain and we pass in this question. At the top of the chain, the standalone question prompt creates its own prompt from that question. It's piped to the LLM to get the standalone question, and that should now be piped to the retriever to retrieve the nearest chunks from the vector store. Well, we're logging out the response. Let's hit save and see what happens. And if we open up the console, we're getting an error. And it's one of those kind of vague errors. E.replace is not a function. So I think what we should do next is isolate our retriever and see if it's working. So I'm actually going to delete this pipe that we put on the end of this chain. And I'm going to set up a second response right here. And this is just a test, so I'm just going to call it response2. And what we're going to await here is our retriever. We'll call the invoke method. And we'll just pass in a standalone question. And I'm going to follow on from this question here and just say, will Scrimba work on an old laptop? OK, let's just log out response2 and see what we get. And look, we are getting some chunks. And we can see that we've actually got four chunks. And the first one starts, what are the technical requirements? So that is looking good for an answer to this question. So I'm thinking that our retriever is working just fine. So why is it not working in this chain? Well, I think if we log out the original response as well, we might see an answer to that question. So let's run this again. And now we've got quite a lot of data in our console, too much to see easily, so I'm just going to paste it into a markdown file. Okay, so what we can see is that where we were logging out the original response, we have got this object right here, and we've got the standalone question, what are the minimum technical requirements for running Scrimba? Can I use it on an old, less powerful laptop? So that was the standalone question. Here we've got our chunks and we've got four of them and that's great. So what exactly is the problem? If you want, just pause for a moment and see if you can figure it out. Okay, so maybe you've figured out that if we have a look at the chain, what we're actually doing when we pass things along the chain is passing them along in their expected data type. So we invoke this chain with this string and the standalone question prompt is expecting a string. And the LLM is expecting the output of the standalone question prompt. It knows what format that's coming in. But when we try to pipe the retriever on the end, what we're doing is we're passing along this object. But what we've just seen from our experiment is that the retriever works with a string. So the only problem here is that we need to be passing along just the string from this response. Now, we could do that with dot or bracket notation, but Langchain actually gives us a better way of doing it, and it introduces us to the concept of an output parser, and that is something that you should know about. So let's look at that next. So Langchain offers various output parsers to suit some specific situations. So for example, you might need to output in JSON, or you might even need binary data. We're not doing anything so complex here, but we can use the most simple output parser, which is the string output parser. And as the name suggests, it's going to pass the output as a string. So if we go back to our code, I've put this chain back to how it was. We're piping in the retriever at the end, and we're just logging out the response. Now, we already know that that doesn't work. We're getting this error. So now let's import the string output parser. And all I need to do is add a new instance of the string output parser to the chain. And it's going to come right in here. So we're taking what we get back from the LLM, and that is what we want to pass as string. So let's come in here and we're going to pipe in the string output parser. And the string output parser is a class and in here I just want a new instance of it. And let's invoke that. And when we hit save and I open up the console, there we are, it is working. We have chained everything together and now we are getting the four chunks back from the vector store. And just to see the string output parser in action, let's quickly delete the retriever. So I'll just delete this off the end. Now when I hit save, the output from the LLM is just a string. Before, without the output parser, we were getting an object. Okay, let's just put all of that back. 
so that is pretty cool. We're definitely making progress. However, you might be looking at this and thinking we've got pipe and pipe and pipe. How many pipes are there going to be in this chain? And also, this chain is called standalone question chain, but we've just added the retriever on the end, and that is a little bit strange. So why don't we just come in here right now and do a mini refactor, and I'm just going to call this chain, chain. And of course, we need to update that where we invoke it. Shortly, we'll be breaking this chain up and doing a bigger refactor. But first, I want to show you the limits of what we can do with just the pipe method. So next, let's think about using what we've got down in the console to try to formulate an answer to our question. Now, I think we're going to run into not one, but two problems. So let's go and check that out. feeling it was starting to get kind of messy and we've got another prompt to add. So to tidy things up a bit, I've taken all of the retriever code and given it its own file here inside this utils folder. I'm just exporting it and then importing it back into index.js right here. The retriever is pretty stable now. We will do a tiny bit more with it later, but it's good to tuck it out of the way. And we'll do that as we go along just to keep things here in index.js manageable. Okay, let's go back to the app. So we've got this chain down here, which we're invoking with this question. And the question becomes a standalone question, which we're using to get relevant chunks of data from the vector store. So if we have a look at our flow diagram, we've done all of this. We're right here. We're finding the nearest match from the vector store. And what we want to do next is create a prompt to get us the answer. Now we're going to do that using three pieces of information. We need the nearest match from the vector store. We need the user input, which we're getting right here. That's not the standalone question. That's the original question that the user asked. And we also need the conversation, which will later be stored in memory. Now we're not doing that until the end. So I'm going to leave the conversation crossed out for now. Now, it might cause you a bit of confusion that we're creating a standalone question here, but we're not actually using it to get the answer. So just to explain, the role of the standalone question is to get the most relevant information from the vector store. The original question might well contain more data, which the LLM can actually use to generate a more relevant conversational answer, but we wouldn't want to use that data to find matches in the vector store. Let me just show you what I mean with a little diagram. So imagine a user comes to our chatbot and they say, I'm a complete beginner and really nervous. Is Scrimba for me? Well, we reduce that to a standalone question. Is Scrimba suitable for beginners? Now, if we use that question to generate our final answer, our final answer would look something like this. Yes, Scrimba is suitable for beginners. And that's a perfectly correct, reasonable answer. And it will leave the user feeling, I think, fairly neutral. Now, if we use this original question when we form the final answer, we can actually use the extra information that we didn't use when we were going to the vector store. So that means we'll be able to form a more conversational response. Yes, Scrimba is perfect for you. We're a friendly community, so don't be nervous. And that will actually give the end user a much more positive feeling from the chatbot. OK, so that's why we're using the original question in our answer template. So now it's time for a challenge. And here it is. I want you to create a template and prompt to get an answer to the user's original question. Remember to include the original question and the text chunks we got back from the vector store as input variables. And you can call those input variables question and context. And I've just put this warning here that if you go ahead and add this to the chain, this is where you're going to find the limitations of chaining pipe methods together. So don't be surprised when you get an error. You might already see where the error is coming from. And in fact, there's going to be more than one problem to solve here, and it will take us several scrims. So really just take this challenge as prompt template practice. And I've put here a wish list of what we want this chatbot to be able to do. So you can think about that as you're writing your prompt. OK, pause now, get this challenge sorted, and we'll have a look together in just a minute. OK, so hopefully you managed to do that just fine. I'm going to come in here then and create an answer template. 
And this is the text I've written. You are a helpful and enthusiastic support bot who can answer a given question about Scrimba based on the context provided. Try to find the answer in the context. So I've put that in there just to emphasize that the context is the knowledge that we want the chatbot to use. If you really don't know the answer, say, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that and direct the questioner to email help at scrimba.com. Don't try to make up an answer and always speak as if you were chatting to a friend. So, so hopefully we'll get a nice, friendly, engaging response from the chatbot. Now, we just need to add in the input variables. So we've got context. And remember, that will be the chunks we got back from the vector store. And we've got question. And then I'll finish the prompt with an invitation to create. OK, now we need to use this template in a prompt. And let's come down here and we'll add it to the chain. So we can just pipe it right on the end. And is this going to work? Well, no, I've already given you a spoiler. This is going to cause us an error. And the error we're getting is missing value for input context. So that's pretty understandable. We're not passing in context in the format it's expecting. So what we need to do at this point is rewind and start sorting out the data we get back from the retriever. It's a little bit of a process, but let's start that in the next scrim. The output from the retriever is this array of objects with metadata, and all we want is the text. And we're not trying to get that text into any special format, we just want a string. So what we can do is create a function to extract the text, join it into a string, and we can just add that function to the chain. So basically, what we want this function to do is map over this array, get the text from page content, and join it into a string. So I'm going to call this function combine documents. And it can take in docs as a parameter, and that will be what we get back from the retriever. And now we just need to return the docs having mapped over them and returned the page content. As we can see down in the console, it's the page content that we're interested in. And we need to join them together. So let's use the join method and we'll take a double new line as the separator. Let's see if that works. So I'm just going to add this function onto the chain. And now let's open up the console. At the moment, we've got the array of objects. And when we hit save, we get back one big string. So that is working. That's really good. Let's try chaining on then the answer prompt that we've got right here. And I'll hit save. And we get an error. We're still missing the value for the input context. And I did warn you, there are multiple problems here. So now what we see are the limitations of this pipe method. We can give the answer prompt a string, but we don't have an easy way to give it the object it wants. Remember, it wants both context and question. But luckily, we have got another way to make chains. It's an alternative syntax called the runnable sequence. We did touch on it earlier, and it gives us more options. Now, it's quite a big topic. We're going to take several scrims to go over it. But before we dive into that, it might be a good time to take a break if you've been doing this for a while. But just before we finish, in my effort to keep this code base a little bit tidy, I'm just going to take this function right here and move it into the utils folder. Right, when you're ready and rested, let's move on. I've got a feature from a language app which is going to take in a sentence and we've got one here, I don't like Mondays, and it's going to do three things. Now you'll notice I've marked some errors in this sentence. We've got a lowercase first letter, we're missing an apostrophe in don't, we've got a D on the end of liked which makes no grammatical sense, and we're missing the uppercase first letter for Mondays. Now the first LLM call is going to solve the punctuation errors. So we'll get uppercase I, apostrophe, and uppercase M. We've still got the grammatical error, but that's dealt with by the second LLM call. Now the sentence is correct, and we'll use the third LLM call to translate that sentence to a given language, in this case, French. Now, if that sounds a little contrived to you, well, it probably is. I was just looking for a not too complex way of demonstrating a few things with runnable sequence, so just bear with me. Now, we've already got the first two prompts here. So we've got the punctuation prompt and the grammar prompt. And then we're invoking the chain. But at the moment, the chain doesn't exist. So let's build it using a runnable sequence. And we're going to start that off by importing the runnable sequence. 
Now let's come down here and set up the chain. So we'll say runnable sequence, which comes with a from method, and we pass in an array. And in this array, we can start building the chain. So we'll start with the punctuation prompt. And let's just open up the console. Let's just hit save and see if that works. And it actually fails. And that's happening because we've only got one thing in the runnable sequence. A runnable sequence needs at least two elements in the chain. So let's add in the LLM. And I'll hit save. And this time it looks like it's working. We've got down in the console, I don't like Mondays. And as you can see, the punctuation has been corrected. The grammar mistake liked with a D on the end is still there. OK, next, let's add the string output parser. And again, I'll hit save. And there we are, we're getting our string. So this is looking like a nice, neat way to do chains. Let's just add in the grammar prompt. We'll hit save. Oh, and that one fails. And again, we've hit the problem that the template in grammar point is expecting an input variable punctuated sentence. So let's just rewind. Now, these three elements in the chain work because what they pass along is in the format expected by the next element in the chain. Now, one thing that's really cool with runnable sequence is that you can put an arrow function in the chain and log out exactly what's happening at that point in the chain to see what's going on. So let's try that now. So prev result is a parameter in an arrow function. And I can call it whatever I want, but prev result seems like a good idea as we're seeing the result of the previous action. So let's hit save and we're going to get an error because we've broken the chain, but we will see what we're logging out. We've got the sentence property holding I don't like Mondays and the language of French. And that is just logging out the result of our invocation that we can see right here. So what I want to do next is move this line of code down the chain. Let's hit save again and we see the punctuation prompt. Let's move it down one more step. And now we see the result of the LLM and move it down to the end of the chain. And we see the result of the string output parser. And this is of course where we hit a problem because the string output parser is giving us a string and the grammar prompt, which is what comes next in the chain, is hoping for an object which looks like this. Punctuated sentence, which is the input variable, and then a string with whatever we got back from the string output parser in here. So we could actually do that. We could come in here and build the object. So we've got the key, punctuated underscore sentence, and now for the value, we can just take pretty much what we've got here, although of course we're going to delete the console.log. So we just return the previous result. And look at that, it works. We're not actually seeing the final result yet, but that's just because we need to chain in the LLM and the string output parser. Let's hit save again. And there we are. Now we've got our sentence. It is completely correct. There's no grammatical errors and no punctuation errors. So this has worked, but I don't think it's very elegant and I don't think it's very intuitive. So in the next Grim, let's refactor this and we're going to find a neater way of doing it. But let me just warn you before we finish, this trick with the arrow function in a runnable sequence is actually very, very useful in some situations. And we are going to be using it in a challenge just a little bit later. So don't forget it. But it's not the most elegant. So let's refactor. Now, one option is to go for a runnable sequence in a runnable sequence. So I'll come right in here, delete this, and create a new runnable sequence right here. And we do that in exactly the same way with the from method. And now I just need to list these three inside that runnable sequence. And of course, delete them from here. And let's just tidy up the formatting. And actually, that line of code is so long, it's never going to look too good. Let's just hit save and see what happens. So it does work. It works perfectly well. But likewise, I think this is rather awkward. So what I want to do is actually extract this chain. So I'll create a const punctuation chain. And that is going to hold this runnable sequence. And now we can have whatever this chain returns be the value of this key value pair. Let's just bring this back onto one line. Okay, let's give it a try. 
and that works. And by the way, this could be a runnable sequence or it could be a pipe chain. It actually just doesn't matter at all. You might find for these chains, which are just a prompt, an LLM and an output parser, that using the pipe method is just as good. It makes the code slightly shorter and it's a matter of personal taste as to which one is easier to read. Now I'm going to leave this as a runnable sequence and I've just realized I've got an unnecessary trailing comma right there. Now I think this is going to look neater still if we also extract the grammar chain. And I'll just hit save and there we are, that works just as well. Okay, so we've got the runnable sequence working, but we need to remember the last part of our app, which is a translation. And where we invoke this chain, we are passing in a language, French, and we're not actually using that as yet in any of our templates. But when it comes to having the translation template, we are going to need it. So I'm thinking I'll just come in here right now and I will add in that translation template. And there we are, we've got a translation template and a prompt which comes from it. So what we'll be needing to do next is potentially give it its own chain. And of course, we need to add the translation chain to the main chain. Now, do you think this is going to work? Well, of course it's not. We've been here before. We're missing the input variable for language. And that figures because we're not actually doing anything with language. We're invoking it here, but we haven't brought it into this chain and we certainly haven't passed it down the chain. Now, strange as it may seem, taking this original input and passing it down the chain is not a trivial thing to do. And Langchain actually give us a special tool to do just that. So let's check that out in the next scrim. Slightly strange app. We've added the translation chain so we should be able to get this translation of our original sentence. Now it's not working and we know why. It doesn't have access to the input variables it wants. It wants the language and grammatically correct sentence input variables. Now the grammatically correct sentence input variable should be coming straight from the grammar chain. So we should be able to break this one into an object and add that really easily. But what about this language input variable? We know it's coming in here where we invoke the chain, but to pass it down through the chain, we actually need to use a special tool. And that special tool is called a runnable pass through. And we're going to import it from exactly the same place that we get the runnable sequence. So we can just add it in right here. Okay, so we use it like this. Let's come to the first element in the chain and we've got this object and I'm just going to bring it down onto two lines. And now I'll add a new key value pair and the key is going to be original input. And the value is going to be a new instance of runnable pass through. Now let's come in here to this second object. And again, I'm going to bring it onto multiple lines. And here I'm going to add a property original input. And for the value, we're going to use an arrow function just to log out what the original input is. And just before we save that, I'm just going to comment out this line. And now we won't get confused by what we see in the console. And we're seeing our errors. But interestingly, we're also logging out the original input. And we can see what original input is in that object. It's the sentence, I don't liked Mondays with no punctuation or grammar and the language French. So it's actually this object here that we passed in when we're invoking the chain. So what we can do now then is destructure original input. And now we're destructuring, we need to use parentheses. And then we should be able to access the language just with dot notation. Let's hit save and see if that works. And it does work. We're getting the language French. So let's just delete the console.log and we'll just return the language. And of course we need to update the key here to language because that is the input variable that we're expecting in this template. And let's hit save and see if it's worked. Oh, and I think I forgot to reinstate this line, which means we'll be waiting a long time. Let's try that again. And it does work. We are logging out our French sentence. So we've successfully removed all of the errors and translated it into French. And the really important thing here is that we've managed to pass an original input right down through the chain so we can get access to language in the final element of the chain. Now, just before we move on, I want to say a quick word about formatting. 
it might well be that if you do use a runnable sequence here, you think it looks better if we bring down the elements in these arrays onto their own lines. And for me, I think that probably does look a bit neater. But that is a matter of personal taste. Now, have a good look at what we've done here, because everything that we've done here is aping something that we need to do in our app. So when we go back to the app, I'm going to give you a big challenge. And when you've completed that challenge, the app should be fundamentally working bar one or two loose ends. So have a good look at this code, make sure you understand everything, and then when you're ready, move on. Challenge. We have studied everything we need to know to get this app to some kind of minimum viable product. What I mean by that is by the end of the challenge, we should be able to see an answer to this question down in the console. And after I've shown you my solution, we're going to wire up all of the DOM elements and then we've just got a few final features to add. Now I've imported the runnable pass through and the runnable sequence for you, so you don't need to do that. And let's just quickly check out the flow diagram to remind us where we are. So we've basically done all of this and now we're going to be getting the answer using the nearest match and the user input. We haven't wired up the conversation yet. We're doing that last. So I'm going to leave that crossed out. You don't need to worry about it. So your challenge is this. I want you to set up a runnable sequence so the standalone question prompt passes the standalone question to the retriever. And the retriever passes the combined docs as context to the answer prompt. Remember, the answer prompt should also have access to the original question. When you finish the challenge, you should see a conversational answer to our question in the console. Now, I think the neatest way to do this is to create three chains, one for each section. So there'll be a standalone question chain, a retriever chain and an answer chain. And then you can bring them together in a runnable sequence. But that said, you might choose to do it a bit differently. Now, I'm going to give you a choice here. If you're up for a challenge, you can go ahead and get to work. But if you'd like a bit more guidance, I've got a file up here called hints.md. And in here, I've listed out the steps that I would take to get this working. So you can refer to that if you need to. Whether you look at that file or not, definitely feel free to go back to the previous scrims to check out the syntax as you do this and take as long as you need. This can be pretty confusing at first, but it really pays dividends to figure this out yourself either with or without the extra help in this file rather than just watching my solution. So really give this your best shot. Pause now, get to work on this and then move on to the next scrim when you're ready to see my way of doing it. And it's probably worth opening the next scrim in a new tab so you can keep your solution to hand for comparison purposes. And massive congratulations if you did. A few tricky bits to remember there. Now, I'll show you how I did it. And remember, my way isn't the one true way. If you got it working, your way might be just as good or even better than mine. So I'm going to come in here and set up three chains the standalone question chain, the retriever chain, and the answer chain. And then this here, we will reuse as the main chain where we bring everything together. On this first chain, I'm just going to use the pipe method and I'm going to chain together the standalone question prompt, the LLM and the string output parser. Now you could do this here with a runnable sequence. It's totally up to you. I've gone for the pipe method on these basic chains because it just keeps the code a little bit shorter. Now we could also bring these pipes onto new lines and that might make things a little bit neater still. Okay, I want to add this first chain to our main chain. So I'm just going to delete all of the code that we've got here. And then the main chain is going to be a runnable sequence. And then we'll pass in the standalone question chain. Now let's just think for a second, this chain will give us two things. It will give us the standalone question and the original question that we'll need in the answer prompt. So let's create an object and we'll have the standalone question and the value there will be whatever's provided by the standalone question chain. And we can have another property, which is the original input. And that will be a new instance of the runnable pass through. Okay, and onto the retriever chain. And here we faced a bit of a gotcha. The retriever chain isn't expecting an input variable, but it needs the string we get from the standalone question prompt. 
So let's get at that using an arrow function. And that means that this chain will need to be a runnable sequence. So the first thing in this chain will be the arrow function that gets us the standalone question. So we'll take prev result as the parameter and we'll return prev result dot standalone underscore question. Next in the chain, we need the retriever itself. And finally, we want to extract the text from the array of objects we got back from the retriever. And we do that with the combine documents function. So in this chain, we're taking the previous result and we're extracting the standalone question from it. That's going to give us the string which we pass to the retriever. The retriever finds the nearest matches and brings them back to us as an array of objects. And the combined documents function extracts just the text from that array of objects and joins it into a string. OK, let's add the retriever chain to our main chain. And what the retriever chain needs to pass on is the context, because that is what the answer template is expecting, as well as the original question. So for the context, let's come in here. With the key as context, the value is the retriever chain. And then for the original question, here we're going to take the original input that we've passed through with this runnable pass through and extract the question from it. And now we just need to deal with the answer chain. And the answer chain is going to be much like the standalone question chain. So we'll set that equals to the answer prompt. And we'll pipe it into the LLM. And likewise, we need a new instance of the string output parser. OK, that is the last link in the chain. So let's just add it on here in the main chain. And now I'm going to hit save and let's see if we get an answer. And look, we do. It says Scrimba is designed to be lightweight and can be used on low spec PCs. So your old laptop should work just fine. So what we're getting there is an answer to this question. And that is really, really good. That is exactly what we want. And the answer we're getting is accurate. It's from information that we gave it in our original document and has been turned into a conversational answer by the LLM. So again, congratulations if you got it to this point. Now, the end is almost in sight. In the next scrim, I'm going to wire up the UI. That's pure JavaScript. There's no AI involved in that. If you fancy it as a challenge, go ahead and do it. Most of the code is done for you. If not, just feel free to sit back and watch on this one. haven't really touched. We've got this event listener which is listening out for a submit event which will fire when this button is clicked and that's going to call this progress conversation function. Now if we come right down to the bottom we can check out that function and all we need to do to get this working is to take this chain invocation right here, cut it and paste it in here. Now I'm going to delete the console.log, we don't need that. And also we want to get rid of this hardwired question and we're going to invoke with whatever the user has inputted and we've got that stored in this const right here question which is coming from user input dot value and that is just being collected from this input on submit. And that is all we need to do. Let's hit save. And now I'm going to ask it a question and I'm going to ask it how long it will take to get a code review for a solo project. Oh, and we're getting an error and it's saying result is not defined. And I think what I've done here is I've called this one response and this one down here result. Well, it doesn't really matter how we change this. Let's change this one to response. And I'll ask it the same question. And there we are, we get a great answer. And that answer has come right from the document that we gave it at the beginning. So that is really, really good. Now I'm going to ask it if it knows about me. Tom Chant is a Scrimba teacher. That's reassuring. It knows that. Now let's start again and I want to do an experiment. I'm going to introduce myself and of course it doesn't know I'm a Scrimba teacher. We've just refreshed. It doesn't know anything about me and in fact I might just make up a name. So I've introduced myself and asked what is Scrimba and there we are. We get a great answer. It gives us a lot of detail greets me by my name so it's being really conversational. Now I want to ask it what is my name. And of course it doesn't know. And the good thing is it's advising us to email help at scrimba.com. So it's got that straight from our prompt. I think that was right there in the answer prompt. Here we are. 
email help at scrimba.com if you don't know the answer. So that's working really well. Now, the fact that it doesn't know my name when I gave it my name right here and it's repeated it once tells us what we already knew, which is that this chatbot has no memory. So the last thing that we need to do then is add some memory to this app. And we've got all of this left on our flow diagram, plenty of arrows going on, so it looks really complicated, but actually there's not much more to do. But we'll come on to that in the next scrim. Some memory. Now, there's two parts to this. There's some JavaScript to set up, and then we'll need to wire the conversation memory into the chain so that the answer prompt has got access to it. Now, I'm going to cover the JavaScript setup in this scrim, and you're going to have the job of wiring it into the chain in a challenge in the next scrim. So firstly, I want to create a const to hold the memory, and this memory is going to be an array, and I'm just going to call it conversation history. So we'll come outside of the progress conversation function, and this is where I'll set it up. And I think I'll abbreviate it to conv history. Now let's add to the conversation history every time a user submits a question and every time we get a response back from the chain. So we'll come down here and we can say conv history dot push and we'll push the question and the response. OK, that deals with a couple of arrows on this flow diagram. So the user input is now saved to the conversation history and the answer we get back from the chain is also added to the conversation history. But at the moment, all we're going to have stored in this array is a bunch of strings, which is fine, but it's going to help the AI understand this better if it's clear which strings come from humans and which come from AI. So I'm going to write a function just to add a human or AI label to each string, and then we're going to join them together into one big string, which we can use in our chain. Now, again, in the interest of keeping index.js as clean and clear as we possibly can, I'm going to create this function in utils. So we'll say function format conv history, and it will take in an array of messages. And then it's going to map over those messages. Now the callback will have each message as a parameter and also the index. And we're just going to work out whether it's a human or AI message by doing some basic maths on the index. So what we're assuming here is that the human speaks first. So the zeroth message will be a human and all of the odd numbers will be AI and all of the even numbers will be human. Now we just want to join them together into one string and let's just join them on a new line character. Now when we call the function on the conversation history, what it will do is it will take the array of strings and convert it to this. So there's one long string, but it's really clear what the human said and what the AI said. Okay, let's delete this and we'll export this function and import it back into index.js. Right, so the setup is done, and in the next scrim, you can wire this into the chain. Let's wire up this memory. Now, at the moment, on this diagram, we need the conversation history right here where we get the final answer to our question. But I think it might help performance if we have access to the conversation history where we're creating the standalone question. It might just help it create a better standalone question in some edge situations. So I'm going to add another arrow to this diagram. Now we want our conversation history from our memory store in two places, the standalone question and the answer chain at the very end. And that means it's time for a super challenge or a medium sized super challenge. It's not quite as big as the previous super challenge, but there is quite a lot to do. So I want you to pass conv history into the chain as conv underscore history at the point where we invoke it. And I've just put remember to make use of our format conv history function. Now, if we just go back to where we invoke the chain, this is where you can pass in conv underscore history. And I've just put the underscore in just to keep up with the same format that we've used throughout. Once you've passed that in and you've used the format conv history function, the next step will be to come to the standalone question template and make use of conv history in that template. And all I mean by that is come here 
into the template, we're going to add conv history as an input variable somewhere and just update the instruction so it knows it can use the conversation history as a resource as well. When you've done that, we need to come to the answer chain and we need to make sure it has access to conv history. So again, down in the chain, you're going to need to do something around here. Once you've done that and the answer chain has got access to conv history, again, you need to come to the answer template and use an input variable to add conv history somewhere in here and instruct it on how to use it. Now, if I were you, I would just use wording in here that makes it clear that it can use the conversation history to help it find the best answer, but that the source of knowledge remains the context. So I'll leave it up to you to think of some wording there, and then you can see what I did. And of course, in the real world, you'd have to play around with this prompt template and just do some experimentation until you get results that you're happy with. Okay, once you've done that, we should be done. So you can test it by giving the chatbot some information and checking in the next question to see if it remembers it. So a really easy way of doing that is exactly what I did before. Tell it your name and see if it remembers your name. Okay, quite a lot to do there. So pause now, give this your best shot, and we'll have a look at it together in just a moment. Okay, hopefully you managed to do that just fine. So let's come down to where we invoke the chain. And I've already added the conv underscore history property and the value there will be conv history. However, before we send that off, we want to format it. So let's take our function format conv history and we'll just pass in conv history. Okay, let's go back to the challenge. So we've got conf history in the chain and we've formatted it. Let's go to the standalone question template to make use of conv history right there. And I'm going to convert this to backticks. And I'm just doing that because like with the answer template, we're going to end up with a list of input variables. So it's just a bit neater when it's backticks and we can spread it out onto multiple lines. Now I'm going to update the text right here. So I've just said, given some conversation history, if any, and a question, convert the question to a standalone question. And then here we've got our requests for input. And then here I'm going to bring things down onto a new line. And we'll add the conversation history input variable. So now we need to make sure the answer chain has access to conv history and we need to edit the answer template to make use of it. Well, that's actually two things in one. Let's come down to the chain and then right here, we're using this runnable pass through to get access to the original question. Now we can do exactly the same thing with conv history. So let's copy that down onto a new line, change this to conv history and change question to conv underscore history. Okay, now let's come up to the answer template. And I'm just going to make some changes here. So I'm going to say you can answer a given question about Scrimba based on the context provided and the conversation history. I'm going to leave this sentence intact. Try to find the answer in the context, but I'm going to add in here, if the answer is not given in the context, find the answer in the conversation history if possible. Now, I think that's going to work, but again, in the real world, we would have to do some testing here, try a few different ways of wording this, and just see what got us the results that we wanted. Now, let's come in here, and we'll just add the conv history. Okay, it looks like we're done, so let's come back up to the challenge, and it's just telling us to test it, so let's hit save. And I'll say, my name's Tom, what is Scrimba? And it's given us an answer to that question, and now I'll ask it what my name is. And it says, your name is Tom. So the memory is working and we have successfully created a chatbot knowledgeable about our document and with a memory. And that is a pretty awesome thing to do when you remember how unthinkable this would have been even just a couple of years ago. Let's just refresh and ask it one more question. And I'm going to ask it, what is the Scrimba community like? And it says the Scrimba community is a global community of friendly and helpful coders. We believe in learning to code as a community activity, so we've set up a Discord server where you can meet fellow coders, share your problems and solutions and network. And that is actually very true, and you can come and hang out with us there. So this project is done. Congratulations on making it through to the end. And let's just take one more scrim to recap what we've learned.
Well, every question I've asked it, I'm happy with the results. But that won't always be the case. So what can you do when performance is not up to standard? Well, there are a few tweaks you can make. Firstly, you could go right back to where we set up the original document and you could alter the chunk size. We went for a chunk size of 500 characters. You could go larger if you think your chatbot needs more context and you could go smaller if you think it needs more granularity. You could also change the overlap size. We went for an overlap of about 10%. Next, you could look at the number of chunks which are actually retrieved. And I did mention earlier that we would say something about that. So let's quickly come over here to the utils folder and find our retriever. Now, right here, we've got this vector store as retriever and we can pass a number in here and that will control how many chunks we get back from the vector store. Let's just see what's happening at the moment if we head down to our chain. And in fact, we want the retriever chain. Here we are. So let's just come in here and I'm going to add in an arrow function and log out what this retriever is giving us. Now, this is going to break the app, but if we just open up the console and I'm going to ask any question. Now, down in the console, we can see that we've got four chunks. Let's come right back here to the retriever and I'm just going to whack this up to 10. And I'll ask a question. And there we are, we get 10 chunks down in the console. And we could, of course, take it down to as low as one. And we get one chunk. Now, I'm going to leave that empty so it defaults to four. I think that is absolutely fine for this use case. But do be aware of that setting because it can be pretty useful. If you get more chunks, you can provide more context. But if you feel your answers are a bit vague and off topic, you might want to reduce that number and just focus in on the best quality chunks because remember the retriever is going to give you the closest matches first. Okay, let's just take that out of index.js because else it's gonna cause us problems. Now you have got other options. You can look to prompt engineering. So just come here to where we've created our templates, the answer template, the standalone question template, and you can just think about how you can tighten those up. I think our prompts are pretty good here, but if you find you're not getting the performance you expect, you can mix things up, go into more detail, add some examples, and just experiment and see what you get. Now, lastly, you shouldn't forget the open AI settings. Again, in index.js, we've got the LLM set up right here. And what we could do, of course, is open this up. And in here, we can use any open AI settings we want. So we've got, for example, temperature, and when working with your own knowledge bot, it might be a good idea to set that to zero. Remember, the higher the temperature, the more daring the AI gets. And we don't particularly want daring here. We're not trying to be creative. So actually setting that to zero might be a pretty good idea. Now, you could also change which model you're using, GPT-4, GPT-3.5, any other new model that comes out. And likewise here, we've got access to frequency penalty and presence penalty. And they might not be so relevant for this use case, but they are there if you need to use them, as well as any other setting that you can use with the OpenAI API. So do be aware of that. And you can always come in here and change things if you need to. I'm of the opinion that if it's not broken, you don't need to fix it. So I'm actually going to leave this exactly as it was. Okay, so those are five things that you can look at if you're not getting the performance you expect. And so hopefully that will be useful if you do run into problems. Okay, we're pretty much done with this. So let's just take one more scrim to recap what we've studied. Congratulations on finishing this course. You now have a really strong foothold in the world of Langchain and you've got the skills you need to build powerful, scalable AI applications quickly. Let's just recap what we studied. Firstly, we used a text splitting tool from Langchain to split our documents into chunks. We created vectors for those chunks using an OpenAI embeddings model. We then set up some templates and prompts and we can see examples of those right here. When the prompts were ready to go, we chained them to large language models and the string output parser using the pipe method. And again, we can see an example of that right here. Now those were the more basic chains and we came onto more complex chains a little bit later. But first, we took the user's input and vectorized it and then found the closest matches from the chunks in our vector store. We used those chunks to generate the final answer and we chained it all together using a runnable sequence, which is a really cool way to build a more complex chain. 
Wow, that was quite a lot. So why don't you head over to our Discord channel and go to the Today I Did channel. This slide is a link right through to that channel and brag to the world about what you've achieved. And with that, all that's left to say is thank you very much for taking this course. Do feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at TPChant. It is always good to hear from you and always good to get feedback. Until next time, good luck.